Welcome to Design Notes, the show in which we find out how the games you love get onto your table. In this week's show, I talk to the Dice Tower's own Jeff Engelstein. We talk about design education and the tyranny of deadlines, among many other things. If you have any comments, please feel free to pop them in the box below, and I hope you enjoy the show. So I'm very privileged to have Jeff Engelstein on the show. Jeff, welcome and thank you for giving your time over. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Ben. So my first question, this is what I ask people and I, in the hope that it'll warm them up and don't feel that you have to be modest. Uh, so my question is... <laughs> That's never been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> when did you know that you were good at what you do? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, well, I, I, I'm still not sure if I, I'm good at what I do, certainly in, in, in a lot of areas. I mean, I, I think all of us, you know, suffer from imposter syndrome, um, you know, and, you know, game design, I'm constantly learning, you know, I think one of the, the, the things I was most proud of was when, you know, when we came out with the Isaac and Shalev and I wrote the mechanism encyclopedia for games. And when that was, um, uh, you know, adopt very well accepted, and then Board Game Geek adopted it as their, uh, you know, basis for their mechanisms, and you know, asked us to help them kind of revamp it. You know, I felt like, oh, okay, you know, maybe I do know what I'm doing, and and people appreciate what it is. So, um, but you know, it's it's always a process. There's no line when all of a sudden, you know, somebody says, oh yeah, now now you're good, and before you weren't good. So, I mean, to what degree is it a sort of inward feeling a, a sort of self-confidence thing and to what degree is it the reaction of people who are had who are actually playing your games um i i think a big part of it is is certainly the reaction that people that people get and you know i i do read reviews and things like that i try not to but you know they always say do get a thick skin and stuff like that and uh you know i think that but i think it's important to you know, be able to evaluate what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong by getting feedback from people. You know, once you release a game and you're getting reviews, it's like kind of an extension of play testing almost. So I think that that reaction is very important. But, you know, look, ultimately, um, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. For me, game design is is still sort of a hobby. I enjoy, I do it for the personal enjoyment and the creativity of it, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not doing it to make a living. My daughter does it to make a living. Um, and she's got sort of a different approach. When they look at it, when I look at a game idea, I'm like, is this going to be fun to do? Am I going to be able to break some new ground and do some new challenges? And that's how I evaluate my output. And from her perspective, it's like, is this going to sell? You know, where is this going to find its place in the market? And that's, you know, that's a, a part of the measure of success. It needs to be a good game, but, you know, that's there's other considerations also. So, so I think you've got to kind of just know what you're looking to do with with it and not just, you know, that that'll that'll be your judge of success and you know you've designed programming games you've designed you know sci-fi games with loads of mini games in them you've designed real-time space combat games you've designed heavy war games do you think it's the fact that it is a hobby for you it's something that you can sort of stretch your enjoyment muscles for want of a better term to that has that has made you so varied in your approach do you think that if it was your sort of main gig that you'd be more focused on a particular type of design um i i think yeah i i think that if i was you know if i was worried about putting food on my table from game designs then yeah i i would be a lot more focused on that and say how can i work with that um you know so for me when i approach a new design or i get an idea it's you know it's and any game designer will tell you, you're going to have to play your game hundreds of times. I think people sometimes maybe exaggerate a little bit because, you know, not always. <laughs> sometimes people say, I've played this game 10,000 times. And, you know, maybe a first move. But um, but I think that um, you've got to do something that's that you're going to enjoy doing, right? And for me, I, I just personally, I like the you know intellectual challenge of, you know, jumping off to some totally crazy new idea and how can we make this work, right? How can you make, uh, you know, whether it make a dice, real-time dice game for Dice Duel or how can I feast, squeeze a pinball machine into a board game, right? Um, but I know there's plenty of 
fabulous designers that I have tremendous respect for that love to revisit that well, you know, and 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 look at it again. You know, you look at it at, at, a, at Agricola and Caverna and Feast for Odin, and you know they're all going back over the same, you know, kind of same ideas, but in a, in a in a different way, in a different approach. Or Canizia when he did a whole bunch of auction games in a row, and he was exploring different things. Uh, you know, I'm typically bad at that. That's why I hate. You know. I guess I like it when publishers come back and say, hey, we want to do an expansion because that means it's sold enough for an expansion. But at the same time, for me, it's like, well, you know, I feel like I put my best ideas into the game the first time around and I'm, hey, you know, having to go back and kind of dredge stuff up. Um, it can be a little bit more challenging for me personally. Um, although I have to say with uh, with Super Skill Pinball, uh, my latest game, we've been I've been working on a bunch of expansions for that. And just the system is so uh kind of pure in a way, I guess, that there's so many different ways you can go with it that I've been having a blast developing uh, new tables and new concepts to fit into that. So that's that's kind of goes against the, the typical rule for me. And and have you ever had a situation where a publisher has approached you and said, we want an expansion, and you've just said, look, I, I don't think this game can accommodate one? Um, I haven't had that. I could, I was was close to it at one point, <laughs> and then the the expansion idea kind of went away. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been approached, and they were like, "Hey, we want a, another expansion, another expansion," and it's it's hard. But um, yeah, I, I guess the main one was I was asked to do a solo module for for one of my games that I just didn't think it could possibly work. So that I kind of walked away from. So you know, you've you've had quite a sort of it'd be fair to say you're kind of a veteran in game design at this point, but you're certainly a veteran in game playing too. What was it about you as a player that led you into the arena of game design, do you think? Um, the hubris to feel like I could do it better, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, it's my adventure in game design started, um, I mean, it's, it kind of had started before I did video games when I was in high school, back in the 80s and stuff like that. So I'd always been doing game designs and messed around with it. And when I was in, you know, my board game club in college, you know, we, we tweaked designs. And I think that's always a good place to start is just doing variations on games you like. Um, but, you know, the first thing was just, you know, I would played, um, you know, the StarCraft board game um, and thought it was really good. But didn't think it felt like StarCraft at all and, you know, wanted to do something that felt like that and, you know, kind of came up with some ideas and got together with my son. I was like, hey, this this would be pretty cool. You know, what do you, maybe we should work on this. And, um, you know, we kind of jumped into it and, and went to just do the design. So it was more of, you know, here, here's a gap of something I would just want to play and I don't see anything that's doing that. And so why don't we just kind of make our own thing? And so, you know, you're at this point you're a designer and and both your kids are designers is there something inherent in the way your mind works that makes you game designers or is it is it just that you're all really into it and it's an it's an inevitable next step <laughs> i don't think it has to be an inevitable next step but i mean i i for me, look, I, you know, I'm trained as an engineer, right? I mean, that's, and that's, you know, physics and engineering was what I studied in college. And even before that, I was always, you know, really into, you know, math and science and stuff. And so I like to take stuff apart, right? I like to take stuff apart and put stuff back together. So, you know, every time I would play a game, it would always be, you know, how can I, you know, analyze, think about analyzing it and, and what is it, what's, what's it doing and how's it working? And, you know, I, I did the podcasting about games and game design well before I ever designed a game, right? I, I did my first pod, I started podcasting on Dice Tower in 2007. You know, I didn't do, just start designing, you know, my first game didn't come out until 2011, right? So during that time, though, I would, you know, certainly analyze games and really get into it and say, what's making this tick? And if I read rules sometimes in rule books that I stumble over or don't make sense to me, I'll think about, well, why, you know, there must've been a reason the designer put that in here. Why, why did they put that in the game? And that would lead me to sometimes a deeper appreciation of the, kind of the art of game design. So just that, that kind of playery aspect of trying to understand the designer's intent, you know, I guess ultimately said, oh, okay, you know, I'm starting to get a feel for the different decisions that are made and how that works. So that's, that's how it all kind of came together for me. And 
you know, you're someone who analyzes and picks apart. And you're someone I, who I think who looks at the process of design. It doesn't seem to be just instinctive in a way that, you know, a lot of people approach their art. So do you have any kind of drills in the, in the way that musicians do scales and sports people do, you know, passing practice? Do you have any kind of drills that prime you for your design? Or is it just a matter of getting into the project and overcoming the problems per project? Um, I don't think that I, I don't have any like specific like, you know, exercises or things that I'm doing. But the things that I find, you know, the thing I feel is most helpful is um, just playing lots of games. Right. And and thinking about them again, do taking that analytical approach. I am no fun to play games with anymore. You do not want to, <laughs> you know, if we I try to turn it off when I'm at cons or something, but usually I'm like, oh yeah, here's a really interesting concept. Of, oh, and this is a remix of this one over here and this mechanism over here and stuff like that. Um, you know, one thing that I that I that I do do, which I, I think is is good for designers, I mean like I said, is already if you know think about extensions of games that you're playing and think about why decisions are being made. But even without playing games, one thing I find really useful uh, and, and I even know some designers that have, have used this technique and have, have had it turn into actual games is a lot of times I'll like, just read about a game. Like somebody will describe a game to me and I won't, but I won't have like seen a video about it or anything. Just like, here's a brief description of what it is. You know, this is like, you know, Mancala in space with this sort of a twist. Right. And then I think about, oh yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. If I was going to design a game like that, how would I make it work? Right. And then I think about what I would do and how it would work. And then when I sit down and play the real game or look at the rules, then I contrast, you know, kind of the idea that I had versus the idea that that was actually in this box. And sometimes I think, you know, my the, the one that came out was was way better than my idea. And it's pretty cool the way they came up with that. And sometimes I think my idea is better and that'll lead me into a different direction of like, oh, yeah, maybe I can use this, you know, in, in a different game. So sometimes just like imagining what a game is going to be like just from a very brief description and, and kind of going, going riffing off of that before you even see the game it can be fun. And, and are you more annoying to play a game with if you think the game is good or if you think the game is bad? Um, probably bad. Uh, <laughs> because then I'll start throwing out things about why I think it, you know, why it's broken or why I think it should be, um, you know, what, what improvements there can be. Uh, but you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I like to think I say that in jest, I do like to think that I'm fun to play games with, but <laughs> you know, we do when, at least with my family, uh, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, you know, when the kids were growing up and even now when we get together, I mean, when we finish a game, the first thing we do is like, okay, what would, what did we, you know, what did we like in this? What didn't we like in this? What would we do to, you know, to make it better? Do you think? And, you know, and I think that's, um, that always helps. I try to dial it down when I'm actually playing the game. So could you give us an overview of, you know, being in the shower, getting the idea for the game design, and then it, it ending up being on a table and having someone like me play terribly with it? <laughs> um, you know, ideas come from a zillion different places. Uh, and... Um, Showers is a good is a good source of that. Uh, you know, reading is a, a lot of reading. Like I said, I come up with ideas just from thinking about games without really knowing about them. But uh, you know, kind of kind of going off of that. Um, and I, I just have a log. I, I I use a program called Evernote to kind of keep track of all my notes. And I I just have a a pinned page to the front of my Evernote, which is called Game Ideas. And I just go through and whenever I get some kind of a crazy idea or whatever, whether it's just a mechanism or whether it's, a, you know, a, just a theme or, or a historical topic or a full fledged design that just kind of descends from from above fully formed, uh, I'll, I'll throw it in there. And, um, you know, even if I don't have time to work on it right now, it's just nice. And periodically I'll take it out and go back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this seemed kind of interesting. And this, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with uh, with these ideas and things like that. So. Um, and then, you know, depending on the ideas kind of, you know, ideas that, that there's ideas that like want to get made. There's ideas that lodge themselves into my brain and want to want to happen. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, then I, you know, I'll start to tinker. I'll start to do it depending on I, I'd like to have, I would say, 
I try to limit myself to having three or four simultaneous projects going on at mm. the same time, which can be a game design. It can be a book it can be, you know, there's different things it can be, but I, um, I could do, I have the opportunity to do like eight or 10 or 12, but, uh, I can't just do like that many just overwhelms me. And, but I can't just do one project. Um, an important part of the way I work is I get stuck all the time. Uh, I'll, I'll hit a wall. I won't be able to do it. I won't be motivated to do it, mm. whatever it is. And I need to be able to set it aside and pick something else up and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm a is kind of hit a roadblock. I'm going to jump over to B. Um, and I'll work on B for a little while, but my brain while I'm working on B is thinking about a, um, and you know, I'll have that breakthrough, you know, it, it'll come, uh, you know, kind of on its own accord or I'll get tired of B and then I'll move to C and then I'll go from C back to a, when I get tired of working on that. And eventually things get done. So for me, kind of having multiple projects is an important part just so I have something to set aside and I've got something else to kind of, you know, occupy the time and make, make myself feel like I'm making progress on at least something, even if it's not project A. Um, and sometimes you have projects that just you never go back to, right? And that's, or, or your brain never solves it. And that's just a sign that they're just, you know, not... There's way more projects on my list of game design ideas than things that have actually seen the light of day. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's definitely far from a one to one on that. So you just got to be you just got to know kind of when to let something go. Um, but once I get into a design, it still follows the same kind of process, you know, where I'll, I'll I'll focus on it. I'll do a lot of I do a lot of kind of theoretical stuff and solo testing, hmm. um, you know, where I pretend to be all the sides. Uh, uh, not a solo mode, but just all, you know, even games that have a large hidden, uh, hidden components and hidden, hidden information. I've just figured out ways to, you know, I, I have selective amnesia that I can just pretend mm. to play all the different sides and get a pretty good feel for what it is. So by the time I bring it out in front of people, I like to have, a, you know, be pretty confident in that, that there's something there and start getting other people's reactions to it. Um, and you know, then there's the, the polish part after that, um, you know, is just the iteration and the polish is, you know, 80% of the time that that initial burst of creativity is the most fun part, but it's also the shortest part. Um, you know, most of it is just kind of iteration and tweaking and changing and trying different systems and seeing what's working, what's not working when you actually, you know, get it in front of people. So, um, so that's kind of my process. And, you know, that can take anywhere from, you know, I've had designs that have been completed in like 14 weeks total from concept to done. I've had designs that have been 14 years from concept to done. Um, and for the most part, I've had the advantage of not having to have a strict timetable um, of when things need to be need to be done. So yeah, so you know, you, you're not just a designer of games, you're also a writer about games, and you've published a few books, and you have a book coming up. How good are you with deadlines? Because I assume with a book, you have a stricter deadline than a game design you're going to pitch, or am I off base here? No, no, no. I I think in general, I'm pretty good with deadlines. Um, I, I like there to be deadlines because uh, I find that it helps focus my, my work. Um, you know, I mean, I'm working on a book right now and it's got a deadline of like October 15th. They need the first draft of the manuscript. And so I know how many chapters there are. And so I know that that means I need to write a chapter about every, you know, two weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. So I've got, I, I know what that is. Um, you know, uh, for, you know, when I did the Expanse game, I've, I've told a story before, but for those that haven't heard it, um, you know, I was approached by uh, that. That was one of the first times that I was like hired to do a game. Mm. Right before that, I was always just like I came up with an idea, I worked on it, and when I felt it was ready, then I would pitch it. Um, and um, but this was was I was approached by WizKids, and they said, "Hey, we've got you know two licenses that we just got. Um, and one of them was The Expanse, and the other one was the Blade Runner movie." Mm. Uh, and um, they um they were like you know we'd love to you know are you interested in doing one of these we'd love to, to have you on board and i was very flattered uh it was no, no one ever had done that for me before and also you know i'm a big fan of, of both of those properties um but uh you know decided that the expanse was i i could more better visualize what that game would be like it seemed like a blade runner game would probably be a hidden trader game which i just right. know is not my strong suit um but they said that the kicker is that they, they approached me in august and they were like you know the final we need the finished product by november right 
And I was like, wow, okay. Um, but I felt like, look, if I'm going to be a, a real game designer, you know, real game designer, uh, and we talk about those, you know, those milestones of when you think you're, uh, when mm. you know you're good at something or things like that, right? I was like, look, if I'm really going to be a game designer, just like with engineering, I mean, I have an engineering product development company, right? So we take on projects and I give customers a deadline. I can't tell them it'll be done when it's done, right? I got to say, it's going to, here's the date, here's the schedule, right? Yeah. So they came in with a schedule and I was like, you know, if I'm going to, I want to see what it's like to design on a timeline and a very short timeline at that. Um, and actually in a way it was very, it was stressful, but it was also kind of liberating um, because I knew given the time frame that I wasn't going to come up with something that was completely innovative. Right. I, right. I, it just can't, I can't invent on demand. So I had to take something that I thought was close to what I wanted. And I did end up adding adding a lot of stuff and tweaking and stuff like that. But I, I'm like, look, I know, I have to know that the bones are going to be solid that I'm building on and go from there. So that was the way I approached the design. And I did not get it done in November. It actually took until January ultimately before we had it all nailed down, but still it was pretty, you know, it was, it was a pretty rapid design in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, if you don't have, you know, so even like when I'm doing stuff now and I'm a designer, you know, even when a game gets signed, you know, I'll, I'll ask the company, you know, when do you need this by? And they're like, ah, eh, it doesn't matter. You know, you work on it and let us know when you think it's ready. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, hmm. don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, give me a date, <laughs> you know? And so they do. And I just find that that just helps me structure the time. So you, you mentioned it earlier, you, you've written that big book of sort of board game terms and board game mechanisms and what they are. So what is the purpose of the book? Who is it for? Um, I think it's for, it's it, it, anyone that's kind of a student of design is what it's for. And actually it came out of my, the idea kind of came out of my game design class that I teach at NYU. Um, and I found that even the students that have played a lot of games, um, uh, you know, and they, they come in, you know, they, there were some prerequisites for the class and, you know, if they had to take an introduction to game design before they could take my class, but most of them were in the program for video game design. There were some that, you know, got it, were into tabletop games, but even the ones that were into board games were, they had played, you know, the, the bit, you know, they had played Catan or maybe Gloomhaven or whatever, right? They, you know, I've played, I can spin around in my basement here, right? I've got, I've got 2000 games in my basement here. I've been playing games since 1974, right? I've played a right. lot of games. I've read a lot of rules. And so sometimes as they would come to me with, you know, Hey, I don't know how to, I'm having a sealed bid auction, you know, we're putting money in the fist and you reveal it. And what do we do if there's a tie We've, you know, and you know, I know eight different ways to break that tie off the top of my head just from playing games. Um, but they just didn't have the experience. And so, um, so that was one motivation was just to, you know, kind of give some, a, a way that they can flip through and just, you know, learn about these different mechanisms out there without having to play 2000 games, right? Here's a way to distill it. Um, you know, the other thing I found it useful for when we started putting it together, because I actually talked to some designers um, about the idea when I first came up with it, because I was concerned. I didn't want it to be like super niche, like just for mm. beginners, right? Right. And and even some really experienced designers, I sent them some sample chapters and kind of laid out and they were like, oh my God, this would be so useful for me. Just as almost like a brainstorming tool sometimes to flip right. through and think about and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so it was helpful for that. But also just, you know, and you talk about the analytical side of it is, uh, you know, I hate jargon, although every, you know, every discipline is into jargon, but at the same point, I, I it's, it, it can be kind of gatekeeping and elitist and stuff like that to just have these terms that people need to use. But at the same time, it's helpful as a practitioner of the art to be able to have a term that we call something that people right. know what it is, right. As a shorthand or whatever. Uh, my favorite example of that is, um, you know, if you have a first player token and you, everybody takes a turn and then when it gets back to the first person, the token passes to the clockwise to the next person, how many games is that in? Right. Right. It's in tons of games. There's no, there was no name for that. Right. Other than just describing it the way I just described it, it was, nobody knew what to call that. You know, you could throw out a few terms and everyone would, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we understand the round structure. Uh, and so and maybe this is, you know, a, a, just another example of hubris, I guess. I was like, you know, well, you know, we'll we'll try to come up with names for some of these terms and hopefully they'll stick. So that one we call progressive turn order. We call mm. that. 
Uh, and then if it goes the other way, if it goes counterclockwise against the order, that's a regressive turn order. Um, and now I've, I've actually heard people, you know, start to use that or terminate like in, input and output randomness is another one just in terms of, you know, structure and things like that. So, so was that yours? I've, I've heard that term a lot and I've used that term myself. Was that, was that your invention, input, output, randomness? Well, it's a little bit murky. Uh, so the, it, we definitely talked about it on, we introduced it, the concept for the first time kind of publicly on ludology. Hmm. Um, and, and we talked about it from there. And then other people kind of picked it up and popularized it from there, which is Keith Bergen and other folks like that. Um, I have a recollection of before that show that a listener to the show, or we, I'd gotten some email correspondence of somebody that had that, that mentioned that term to me. That's kind of my recollection from back in the day. Ryan doesn't really agree. It feels like we just kind of talked about it and came up with it. Hmm. Uh, but I have repeatedly, I have looked for that email. I have posted on various forums. Like if you were that listener, please come forward. I'm trying to, you know, tr I'd be really interested to trace it down. Um, but uh, nobody has. Uh, so it's possible my recollection was wrong and we did actually, uh, I coined that phrase, but you know, if that's my legacy, I'm, I'm happy with that. So, <laughs> well, if there's any, if there's any money in the term, <laughs> the listener was me. Okay. There you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the vast fame and fortune awaiting a person. So I don't know. I, I, I feel like I heard it someplace else, but I have not been able to trace it back down into what it was. And as far as I can tell, I, we were the, we were certainly the earliest ones to actually, you know, talk about it publicly mm -hmm. like that. So, so take that as you will. Um, but so, yeah, so, you know, we, t we put that all and kind of pulled all that stuff together and felt that, you know, for all those things that that book would be useful. And so intended for game designers and folks like that. So those not familiar with the book, it's called Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Development. So it's just, it's set up like an encyclopedia. It's got a, just a couple of pages for each of the mechanisms. It's about 200 different mechanisms in the book. And, and so what benefit, so, so game design has always been up until this point, a very sort of ad hoc sort of feels like people in their garages coming up with game design, sort of craft cottage industry sort of thing. What is the benefit of a sort of more, more formalized training in game design? Will we get better games? I think we absolutely will be better games. And I think we're already seeing that. I mean, I think that, you know, if you can, grab these different building blocks and build on top of it. You know, if I can use it, I'm going to use some deck building aspects and some this and that, even the way like we talk about games when we pitch them has changed. You know, I it's so people don't have to reinvent the wheel every single mm. time, right? You know, so it's important to be educated in those foundations. I mean, I, and I think it's really amazing if you, you know, I mean, games, board games have been played by humans for like 10,000 years, right? I mean, it's, you know, just about every any any kind of archaeological dig of any sort of substance uncovers some gaming materials, right? It's hmm. you know the dice or throwing sticks or or boards etched into rocks. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that people found. It's been with us forever, but it's never been studied in in the way that it's kind of being studied now. And some people tried to do it, like Sid Saxon in hmm. in the '60s was kind of into that and started looking at it. Um, you know, and try to take a more analytical approach. And there was other designers he was friendly with, like Bob Abbott and people like that, that really kind of got together. But really, most people were just feeling their way through, you know, it was just, you know, people were, which it, which is an exciting time, you know, during the 70s and the 80s, when people were coming up with these new concepts. And, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden Dungeons and Dragons appears on the scene. Uh, and, uh, you know, but in, in, in the 90s with the Euro games, I mean, there's just a lot of that stuff. But, you know, I think it's, super valuable to go back and, and look at those games and understand them and understand the tools and kind of how you build up, you know, you can always break rules, right? You know, you can, there's, there's always, but it's important to understand the rules and why they're there so that you can break them in a more, um, uh, thoughtful manner. Um, and, um, uh, I had another really terrific point I was going to make about this. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's just like if you're playtesting, I mean, like a lot of people ask me, like, do I need to study math, right, or, or learn probability in order to be able to design a game? And the answer is absolutely not, right? Um, and you can just go and you can test it. But 
Like I just did this the other day. I analyzed a whole bunch of different dice mechanisms until mm -hmm. I, I knew kind of the curve I wanted. And I was like, how can I change the dice or put symbols on the dice to get the feel that I want? Or what mix do I want in the cards so that you draw this type of hand typically, right? And for me, I can sit down and do that math. Um, and I've developed some helpful tools to do that, uh, some of which I just recently released publicly, if you want to try it. Um, but um, it's, 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 uh, it's shorter for me to get there. If you're if you're sitting there play testing a game and you play it a thousand times, you're going to get a really good feel for what a typical mm -hmm. hand is like and what the chances are and stuff like that. You'll get to the same place that I get to using the probability, but I right. will get there faster, right? And so you don't need to learn probability, but it helps. Same way, if if you know and off the top of your head eight different ways to break a tie and you know all the different ways that you can do turn order, right? Then when you sit down and you're designing a game, if something's not working, you're like, oh, you know, this is it's I need to go with a progressive on this or maybe regressive mm. would be better. Right. And and that acts as a shortcut. You'll probably get to the same place or a similar place. But just having those tools ready for yourself and understanding what they are is going to make things just faster. So I've got two more questions for you. So the first one okay. is you're at a convention. It's in the evening. You've been out to a restaurant and you're, you're coming back from the loo and you hear a table of gamers and you hear your name mentioned. So you sidle into a corner and you eavesdrop on them. What do you hope that they're saying about you? Um, I... Are, are they they're playing a game? <laughs> they're they're in the restaurant and, and they're, they're just talking oh, they're about... Sort talking of, about me? Yeah, and they're talking about you as a designer. You know, I, I hope that they feel that the you know that that um, I've you know put stuff in the world that's uh, you know has made uh, given people enjoyment, uh, whether it's you know from flat out you know just fun or, or making things more thoughtful. Um, I, I hope that they say that you know maybe about a certain topic that I've made them think about it in a different way or given them a, a different perspective on it. Um, you know, I think ultimately that's you know that that's the legacy that I would like to leave is that, you know, people, uh, you know, approaching things from, you know, just from, from a different perspective and not just accepting things as they see, but trying to look a little bit deeper. And so the last question then, why is gaming good? Um, why is gaming good? <laughs> yeah. I, as I said, it's, it's ultimately it's part of the human experience. Right, game and play is something that is so deeply ingrained in us, um, and it allows us to. Um, it, it just factors into to so much of the human experience. Um, I, you know, I talked about you know archaeologically, and and some of the earliest studies about game were from an anthropology standpoint mm. and coming from from that perspective. Um, but I feel that the you know play allows us to you know, explore different areas in a safe way. It enables us to empathize uh, with, with other peoples and other issues in ways that maybe we would not have empathized uh, just in, in other ways. Um, I feel that it gives us the opportunity to explore, you know, periods in history and topics and things like that in, in a way that, that is, is a much more engaging introduction for people. You know, how many more people now are out there birding because of the wingspan, right? right? Or right. things like that. And, you know, like my kids, um, as much as they hated it, I think, you know, every time they had a new a history subject in school, I would trot out the game and we would play, you know, about, you know, oh, you, can, you're, you're, you know, you're starting to study about this, you know, this thing or the French Revolution or whatever, you know, let's take out this game and, and talk about it. And I just feel like it gives you a, a different perspective. So, you know, that, and I think it also gives ourselves challenges and makes us understand ourselves better in a way because games ultimately are about imposing artificial restrictions on ourselves right if i'm playing golf and the objective is to get the ball in the hole the easiest way is to walk over to the hole and drop the ball in you know all the other rules of golf are just things to get in the way but that of of you doing it the simplest way but that's what a game is like a, a game is um is a, is is kind of things you have to do that are get in the way but but by getting in the way they also give us the ability to manage our own lives better i mean uh, you know in, in anthropology rituals are also kind of considered game like you know so a lot of religious activities also kind of fall into the game area because mm -hmm. it's artificial restrictions like you know keeping kosher or certain dietary things or whatever right and um 
you know, I, I'm not, uh, and I feel that games help us exercise that in the same way, that sort of self-control, right? We're all, we all have to follow the rules where this is what we're all doing. You know, this is, we've agreed, we've stepped into the magic circle, which is a whole other conversation, mm -hmm. right? And, and so by, I, we are all as, as a group taking on restrictions that we can't just do thing, whatever we want to do. We're agreeing to abide by rules. So, you know, that that's in essence, that's what society is, right? That's what self-control is. And all religions kind of have those aspects. Like if you want to be part of this group, you have to follow these rules, but also a lot of them have periods where you, you deliberately deny yourself something, whether it's hmm. Lent or whether it's Yom Kippur or whether it's Ramadan, right? We've all agreed that this is what we're going to do. And I think that by doing those little mini experiences of gameplay, it's like when it comes to the bigger and realer things in life, it gives you the tools to say, this is how we're going to work together. And this is how we're going to exercise, you know, the kind of self-control and self-discipline to be able to achieve great things. So to wrap up then, what can we expect to see from Jeff Engelstein in the next 12 months? Um. Well, we've got, uh, there's, there is the first uh, standalone expansion for Super Skill Pinball coming out called Ramp mm -hmm. It Up, which is exciting. I'm also working on another, uh, another expansion beyond that, which I can't talk about yet, just by tech, that uh, I, will, I will say that we are working on other tables, some of which are super cool. Um, and um, I've got um, uh, a new game from GMT, which is going to be coming on in the PMT 500 uh, shortly. Uh, may even be on by the time this comes out, depending on, on what happens. Uh, and um, and also I'm working on a, a, a book, uh, which is not game related, uh, but which I'm very excited about, but which I can't say anything about. And unfortunately, it's not going to be out until 2023, because as insane as game publishing uh, <laughs> uh, lead times are, and, and if you're looking to be a game designer, that's the first thing to know is, is everything, once it gets in the hands of the publisher, is going to take way, 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 way longer than you want it to do. Uh, to the point where most of my games, when they actually are reach people, I've forgotten how to play, and I start getting rules questions, and I have to go back and like I don't remember that. Um, but that one's coming out in 2023. So book publishing is even worse than than game publishing is the point. So uh, so I I'm super excited about that book. A lot of the ideas I've been developing over the years um, I, I think are really coming to fruition in this. So I'm hoping that I can do it justice. Brilliant. Well, Jeff Engelstein, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. It was a blast.